Great. Well, um, welcome to everybody. If you are um, joining us now, um, it should take a very short time to um, to appear. We'll just look at the participants. I can see we're already zooming up to 63 and uh, shortly over 100. So good afternoon to everyone as you join. Um, um, when I say good afternoon, of course, that's the Europeans. Um, good evening to those of you joining us from as far afield as Australia uh, and, and in Asia. Uh, good morning to those of you joining us from uh, the US, from uh, Central America, from South America. Uh, this is very much a, a, an international um, uh, screening. Um, so, so welcome to one and all. When you um, arrive, um, please feel free to um, introduce yourselves in the chat box, give your name, your organization, um, where you're Zooming in from. Uh, that would be great so we get an idea of, of, of who's here for this event. And, um, and as you're arriving, I think I can take the opportunity. Um, I will introduce myself in a second, but I'll wait for everyone to, um, to who's coming to arrive. Uh, just to give you a brief idea of um, what we'll be doing, I'll briefly um, give an introduction to the film, um, then we will uh, be screening the film. And then after that, um, we will uh, move to um, our panel, uh, saying a few words to our distinguished guests, um, Vanessa Nakate, um, Caroline Lucas MP, Professor Salim Hook, Hajit Singh, um, and Jeff Estella, and um, they'll speak for roughly five minutes, after which we'll have a QA and a um, and then we'll round up proceedings and uh, should close by around four o'clock. Um, if you would like to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag loss and damage. Please look as well um, in the chat uh, for instructions. My colleague Charlotte will be sending out instructions as we go along, especially very importantly to disseminate the film when it goes live uh, after we've shown it. Um, and as well, if you've got uh, questions for the panel, please um, pop them in the Q&A box. Um, giving your name, your organisation, and who your question is directed to. So, I think without further ado, I'm going to move into the sort of the, the proper introduction. So let me just say, I'm David Hillman. Um, I'm director of the Robin Hood Tax Campaign, and we're one of the founder members of the Make Polluters Pay Coalition. Um, and I, I want to, to welcome you to this uh, to this film launch. Um, and this is part of the world's first ever loss and damage awareness day. Uh, this is one of a number of activities that is happening today, including vigils and the launch of a petition to win political backing uh, for loss and damage finance from the UK and Scottish governments, um, which immediately turns me to the world of politics. Uh, and the world leaders meeting this week in New York for UN Climate Week. Now, those of you who know me will know that I'm not in the habit of quoting the UK's Prime Minister Boris, but I have to say uh, some of what he said at the UN in the last few days is worth quoting and has resonance with the film we are about to see. Um, he spoke of um, the world, this precious blue sphere with its eggshell crust and wisp of atmosphere. He said, we started this industrial revolution in Britain. We were the first to send the great puffs of acrid smoke to the heavens on a scale to derange the natural order. And he also said, and I quote here, it is the developing world that is bearing the brunt in terms of hurricanes and fires and floods and the real long-term economic damage that they face. And yet, it's the developed world that for 200 years has put the carbon in the atmosphere that's causing this acceleration of climate change. So it really is up to us to help them. The problem is, the problem is he's talking the talk, but he's not walking the walk. The problem is, as you will hear in the film, politicians are not responding in a way that is proportionate to the scale of the problem. So our first job is to make 
to make our first job to make political change happen is to put loss and damage firmly on the map. And that's what Loss and Damage Awareness Day is all about. And um, to put loss and damage finance into the spotlight. Um, and that's what we really hope that this film goes a long way to do. Um, so without further ado, I'm proud to give you the first ever screening of This Is Loss and Damage, Who Pays? And I'll hand over now to Kat to do the honors. The present is already catastrophic. The present is already scary. If we fail to address loss and damage, the future will be much worse. This is loss and damage. It's what happens when climate change intensified disasters like hurricanes, wildfires and floods, and slow moving catastrophes like droughts and sea level rise lead to a loss of life, culture, biodiversity, territory, and livelihoods, as well as damage to homes, hospitals, schools, and roads, which often forces people to flee their homes. Loss and damage as of this year, 2021, is taking place in every single country in the world, including the rich countries. But the biggest impacts are on poorest people living in the poorest countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. If your island is going underwater, you have to leave. If your farmland is turning into desert, you have to move. And if forest fires are destroying your home, what choice do you have? Last year, around mid-May, we saw heavy rainfall causing four rivers to bust their banks in the western part of the country, causing massive destruction and leaving over 100,000 people displaced. In the global negotiations on climate change, in the Paris Agreement agreed in 2015, there's an article, Article 8, that says we need to deal with loss and damage. But unfortunately, there hasn't been a single penny paid for loss and damage yet. And this is a problem because areas prone to loss and damage are no longer insurable. Insurance is something that works on probability. When you know that you are definitely going to face climate impacts, insurance doesn't work. Therefore, money for people to put their lives back together needs to come from somewhere else. Those who are at the front lines are the least responsible for the climate crisis. I do believe in the polluter pays principle. Fossil fuel companies and the biggest polluting countries, they have the responsibility to provide compensation for loss and damage. The major fossil fuel companies around the world have known for decades that they were producing a polluting product and they have suppressed that information and they prevented action. As a result, they've made billions of dollars of profit and therefore they are completely liable to be challenged now to pay up for the loss and damage that they have knowingly caused and they have profited from. Although there is clearly a pressing need to support communities impacted by loss and damage, finance has been blocked, denied and deemed too expensive by those who have polluted. The Global North hasn't done anything about loss and damage because it has refused to accept responsibility for the climate crisis. They don't want to pay the bill. With similar compensation funds already in existence, it is high time to set one up for loss and damage. We do have an example of uh, compensation for pollution. The major oil companies quite willingly put money into a pot. And if there's an oil spill anywhere, the people who are affected don't have to prove which company caused it. That's the kind of thing that we need for loss and damage from climate change. The present is already catastrophic. The present is already scary. And if compensation is not given, the future is going to be much worse. With COP26 rapidly approaching, it's time to put loss and damage firmly on the agenda. COP26 coming up later this year is a critical event where the issue of loss and damage has to be front and center. Otherwise, the developing countries, particularly the most vulnerable countries, will deem the COP a failure. The COP will be successful only if a compensation fund is put in place for communities that are facing the impacts of the climate crisis right now. We have been waiting and waiting for the last 30 years, and we cannot wait any longer. If we do not address loss and damage, then there is no climate justice. It's not just what loss and damage is, but what it means. 
It speaks of the existential threat that the heating of our fragile band of atmosphere represents. It's the signpost of what's to come. The alarm bell that tells us we are running out of road for ignoring it as if it isn't there. We are running out of road for doing nothing proportionate to the scale of the problem. We are running out of road. Taking care of those at the sharp end of this climate change that is happening now, not tomorrow, but now, is urgent and long overdue. Great. Great, thank you, is it back to me? Yep, okay. Uh, well, um, I think, and I wanna say just straight off, you know, it's been a tremendous um, effort from a host of people to make the film. And I'd like to thank the many, the many of you, I know a number of you will be um, at this event who have fed back your comments to us, which uh, really helped to, to, to shape the film. But most particularly, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank so much Teo uh, Orman Skeeping, the director, without whom this film would not have been possible. So thank you so much, Teo, for all your work on this. Um, and also uh, a big thank you to Mark Strong, the actor who, whose mellifluous tones um, um, really do uh, make that narration very strong. So thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, and of course, not least the people uh, interviewed in the film, Vanessa Salim and Hajit, who are about to turn to as part of our panel as we move to the next part of uh, this event. Um, but before we, we hear from them, um, you, you, the audience, have a job now. Your job is now that that film is live, is to uh, share the links, to get it out there, to get it far and wide. That is the purpose of Loss and Damage Awareness Day. So, so please uh, join in um, and go to see those links uh, that you'll find in the chat that Charlotte would have put there. Uh, so we can quickly share them. Okay, so um, I'm going to turn now to um, to ask um, Vanessa to speak first, to say a, a few words of introduction uh, for her. Um, Vanessa Nakati is a climate activist from Uganda and founder of the Africa-based Rise Up movement. She began protesting in the streets of her hometown Kampala in January 2019, after witnessing droughts and flooding uh, devastating communities in Uganda and now campaigns internationally to highlight the impacts of climate change. Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be speaking with all of you today. I hope that you're doing great wherever you are. My name is Vanessa Nakate and I'm a climate justice activist from Kampala in Uganda. And like you've had, I started doing activism in the first week of January 2019, after seeing how much the climate crisis was impacting the lives of the people in my community and in my country at large. I come from a country that heavily depends on agriculture, on natural uh, resources for survival. And this means that uh, extreme weather events like uh, floods or droughts it means farms are either going to be washed away and destroyed, houses are going to be destroyed, or crops are going to uh, be dried up, and water sources are going to, you know, to to get dry. So um, this is a reality for many people in my country, but not just my country, uh, across the continent of Africa, across the global south. 
uh, Africa as a continent historically is responsible for only 3% of global emissions. And yet Africans are already suffering some of the worst uh, impacts of the climate crisis. We have seen uh, the unfolding of many catastrophic weather events in Africa. We have seen um, countries in the southern part of Africa experience extreme uh, dry conditions leading to water scarcity. We have seen extreme floods um, in, in East Africa causing massive destruction. We saw the locust evasion in East Africa as well. And you know these locusts were eating everything that were coming across in people's farms causing food shortages, causing uh, food scarcity. So we all remember the, the cyclone Idai that ripped apart large parts of Africa, uh, leaving more than 1,300 people dead and many more were recorded as missing. So the climate crisis has been here in, uh, in the global south and people have seen the worst of it. People's lives have been impacted. People have lost their homes. People have lost their businesses. People have lost their lives, you know, and people have lost their cultures, their traditions, and their history because of the, uh, the climate crisis. That is why uh, we strike. That is why we demand for climate justice from the leaders. That is why we demand for action, for a future that is livable, a future that is healthy, a future that is sustainable and equitable for all of us, a future where the people and the planet are put above our pipelines, are put above uh, coal power plants, are put above greed and you know short-term profit. This is the kind of future that we want, and this is why we speak up and you know demonstrate and demand. For climate justice, but we cannot have, uh, you know, this future that we hope to achieve if loss and damage is not put on the agenda. Like I've said, uh, people are losing everything. You know, people are losing their lands, people are losing uh, islands, people are losing their traditions, people are losing their history. You know, people are being left with nothing as the global temperatures rise. And it's important to note that these are the people who are least responsible you know, for the climate crisis. So it is important for the leaders, for the governments, um, at the upcoming climate conference uh, in Glasgow to put loss and damage on the agenda and to provide uh, adequate financing for this as many people's communities are being destroyed right now. We need to minimize the impact. We need to put the people and the planet above profit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, so much uh, for these um, uplifting words. Um, really, really appreciated. I'll turn straight over to um, Dr. Salim Hook, uh, who is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, and an expert on the links between climate change and sustainable development. Over to you, Salim. Thank you very much, David, and congratulations on a powerful uh, film. Um, so let me pick up um, the loss and damage story from the scientific side. Um, <clears throat> one of our problems with putting loss and damage on the table for discussions over the years has been difficulty in attributing a given you know, hurricane, cyclone, flood, fire because of human induced climate change. Because these are natural events, they're becoming more severe because of climate change, but you know, making the case that this happened because of climate change was very, very difficult. This is called the science of attribution. Uh, it wasn't easy, it wasn't good. It took a long time to do. That has now changed. It's been a game changer with the sixth assessment report, working group one, which is the scientists, uh, uh, which was published on the 9th of August. For the first time, this is the sixth time, sixth report they've done over 30 years. For the first time, the scientists have said they can unequivocally attribute the impacts of human induced climate change because we've taken the temperature above one degree centigrade already because of the emissions of greenhouse gases over the last century and a half since the industrial revolution. And therefore attribution science now kicks in 
in a very big way. And that's happening every single day somewhere on the planet. It's extreme weather event is broken, sometimes not just broken incrementally, but shattered. Uh, the heat wave that hit uh, North America, Northwest America, uh, uh, Oregon State and Canada, it broke the world record, their own world record of heat on the Monday, and then that record was broken on the Tuesday, and then that record was broken on the Wednesday, and then again on Thursday, and then again on Friday. By the time they ended, it was five, six degrees higher than anything that they had ever seen before, and people were, you know, thrown out of their homes. People have actually had to uh, create climate migrants in Canada, in the town of Liddell, and, and also in California. And so the impacts of human-induced climate change attributable to human-induced climate change are now happening all over the world. The flash floods in Germany that killed more than 150 people in Germany, absolutely uh, attributable to human-induced climate change. Hurricane Ida that hit the United States uh, coast of Louisiana and then traveled all the way to New York and New Jersey. And the floods in New York that flooded the subways and killed more than 50 people in, in the uh, northern US again, attributable to human-induced climate change. And even, you know, President Biden now admits it, uh, and uh, Chancellor Merkel admits it, nobody is denying this anymore. The denial uh, uh, industry has gone out of business. And so we now need to accept it. Now, that moves us to what are we going to do about it? And we, the developing countries, have been asking for, uh, you know, finance and dealing with this issue uh, commensurate with the scale of the problem and not been getting anywhere at all. We got some things. We got the Warsaw International Mechanism, which is a talk job to talk about it. They've done some good things in terms of studies, but the issue of finance has been a deadlock. You know, the rich countries simply aren't interested in giving any kind of finance for loss and damage. However, in the last few weeks alone, Chancellor Merkel, when she visited the flood hit areas in Germany, and Joe Biden, when he hit the flood hit areas in New York and New Jersey, both of them out of thin air found hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government in Germany and the federal government in the United States to compensate their own victims of loss and damage from climate change. When they're citizens of the US and citizens of Germany, the money appeared out of nowhere, thin air, hundreds of millions of euros and hundreds of millions of US dollars. I have no objection to that. I think that's a good thing as leaders of their own countries, they should pay compensation to their own citizens who are victims of loss and damage. But I say, what about the citizens of the rest of the world? What about uh, Vanessa's citizens in Uganda? What about my citizens in Bangladesh? They are being affected as well and they have been affected for quite a long time. What about giving them some funding? Uh, you don't have to call it compensation or liability. Call it solidarity, call it support, call it whatever you like, but let's see some cash. And let's now is the time to push for that. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Salim. Uh, these points about, um, about the attribution of human-induced climate change are very, very well made. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for that and, and for this, the, the strong words. So um, I'll move now over to Hajit Singh, uh, who's based in India, Senior Advisor on Climate Impacts with Cannes International. Uh, as a global expert in this field, he's worked uh, uh, for many, many years to support countries across the world in their efforts to secure finance for loss and damage. The floor is yours, Hajit. Thank you, David. Pleasure to be uh, part of this event and uh, also uh, the sending the message how important the role of loss and damage uh, negotiation is. Uh, let me add to what uh, Salim and Venice already said. It has been 30 long years. It's not a new issue. Vanuatu brought up the issue of adverse effects way back in 1991. Uh, at that moment, even before the convention was put into place, we wanted a system to be very much part of the convention itself, but it was ignored. And we kept fighting for it. After a lot of struggle, finally we got a mechanism in 2013. It was known as Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage. But what has happened since then? We did make some progress in generating knowledge, in doing coordination, a lot of talk, which has helped put a spotlight on the issue. But the reality is that poor people who are facing climate emergency have not gotten a single penny 
to recover from climate impacts. And, and this, is not, this has not happened by accident. This has happened by choice because rich countries since then did not allow any progress to happen on finance. They made sure that this mechanism, which very much has delivering finance as one of its function, has been rendered as an empty shell. And this is when we are talking about the word, Salim talked about attribution, 90% of disasters, and this is what UN says, 90% of disasters world over are weather related. And now climate change has a handprint on almost each of these weather related disasters, which means all the communities who are suffering from weather related impacts need to be supported. Yes, we have a humanitarian system in place, but is that sufficient? Is that commensurate to the need that we are facing right now when the cost of disasters are going up? According to some sources, the cost of damage in developing countries is going to be between 290 to 500 billion dollars. Let me repeat, 290 to 500 billion dollars. And by every year, uh, by 2030, and here we are fighting for 100 billion dollar for the entire climate action. And all the reports and the recent OECD report again puts loans and guarantees and everything as if by cooking these numbers, we will be able to solve the problem of climate crisis. We have not even taken the account of inaction that has happened over the last three decades. And that inaction is piling up uh, this loss and damage. And who is suffering? It's the same poor and developing countries who did not have a role in causing the crisis. And they are the ones who are not getting any support as global community. We have left them on their own. And imagine, as Vanessa also said, at COP26, loss and damage is not even on the agenda, which means there is not going to be any political discussion on an issue which is about life or death uh, for people in developing countries. For developed countries, they have money. As Salim said, you know, they are they're able to find millions and billions to support them, to help them recover from these disasters, to reconstruct uh, their homes and economies. But what about poor people in developing countries? And rich countries do not even want to discuss that at COP26. Now, we cannot allow such injustice to continue. We demand that UK government, the COP26 presidency and rich countries they should establish a system at this COP and it should be operational by next year so that people who are suffering and facing this climate crisis should start getting money so that they can recover from these climate impacts. The current funding system, I must say, is based on whims and fancies of these donors and rich countries and depends so much on geopolitics and trade. No, we do not want that system. When people are suffering, we want a fund that is based on equity, that's based on justice and solidarity. That's what is needed at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hajit. Um, it is, of course, an absolute disgrace that um, that loss and damage is not on the official agenda of COP26, and that is very much part of why uh, loss and damage awareness day is so important and why this work to raise awareness, consciousness of this problem is so vital. Um, so um, thank you so much for your words. I will um, now pass on to uh, Jeff Estella from the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition. Uh, Jeff is one of the co-founders of the Youth Climate Strike Movement in the Philippines and is joining us to share his personal experience of loss and damage. Jeff, over to you. Jeff, are you there? I can't see Jeff on my screen. Shall I move to Caroline? Okay. So um, let me introduce um, Caroline Lucas, who is the Green Party's first MP, uh, representing Brighton Pavilion since 2010, formerly uh, party leader. 
she served as MEP for 11 years. That's where I think I first met you when, when I was doing my trips to Brussels. Uh, and Caroline is chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Climate Change. The floor is yours, Caroline. Thank you so much, David, and thank you for this um, really important opportunity to, to, to speak. Uh, a real honour to join this panel today with such expert speakers. And as the film made so powerfully clear, loss and damage is happening right now. We're not talking about some future potentiality, some future risk, it is happening right now. We've all got so many examples. Madagascar, for example, on the brink of what the UN thinks is one of the first climate change famines. Last year's cyclone Harold hit Vanuatu, leaving up to 90% of the population homeless. In Dominica, Hurricane Maria destroyed 100% of the crops. It damaged around 226% the damage accounted to in terms of, of that country's GDP. But it isn't only the financial losses, vast as those are, but it's also, as Vanessa eloquently said, the loss of culture, the loss of history, the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems. And we're now seeing loss and damage in all countries of the world. A recent report from the Red Cross showed that extreme weather events have killed over 17,000 people globally just since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and impacted almost 140 million. But as Salim all said, although loss and damage hits all countries, not all countries are equally able to withstand that shock. And I think the kind of statistics we're talking about are quite literally devastating. They are impacts that for most countries simply cannot be adapted to. They are, they are vast costs, which countries in the global south simply cannot be left to bear on their own. And it is a profound issue of justice, obviously, that the impacts of a overheating world are being felt most keenly by those who have done least to contribute to it. The Climate Vulnerable Forum predict that developing countries could face annual financial losses of $4 trillion by 2030. But the UK, as the country that kick-started the Industrial Revolution and has profited enormously from it, the UK has a particular historic responsibility, not only to cut its emissions further and faster than most, but also to act in solidarity with those who are now facing the worst impacts of the climate crisis that frankly we have done so much to drive. Loss and damage has had a very problematic history in climate negotiations. Some small progress has been made in some areas under the UK presidency, most notably the commitment to operationalize the so-called Santiago network on loss and damage with consultations being held in partnership with the Chilean presidency to discuss this more with vulnerable countries. I hope very much that what they say will be heard and understood and that there will be a COP decision to formally establish that network. But in so many ways, loss and damage is always the poor cousin in the discussions. As Samuel said, despite being enshrined in Article 8 of the Paris Agreement, it is always far too often overlooked by successive presidencies, but certainly by the UK presidency, to the extent that it is notably omitted from the goals of COP26. The presidency programme fails to carve out specific time for its discussion. Instead, it's rolled into a general discussion on just one day around adaptation, with which it is all too often confused. We had the Prime Minister in New York for the UN General Assembly, the UK Prime Minister. You know, we heard from, from David all the fine words that he was saying, but all of that was, was first of all responding essentially to the $100 billion that has been promised since 2009 that would be made available on a yearly basis as of 2020, and which is still, we are still off uh, being able to fulfill that amount. So already we are failing on that commitment. But the commitment to loss and damage is in addition to that. It's not part of the adaptation funds, it is separate from and in addition to. And yet that discussion, interestingly, was absolutely absent from what our Prime Minister was saying at the UN General Assembly, despite his recognition that, and I quote, the biggest economies in the world that are causing the problem, while the smallest suffer the worst consequences, that acknowledgement should mean that loss and damage is absolutely at the heart of COP26, not sidelined. Now, climate vulnerable countries worked hard for loss and damage to be included in the Paris Agreement, failure to deliver on that totemic issue, I think could quite literally mean failure in Glasgow. It is a matter of absolute trust, just as the 100 billion is, so is action on loss and damage. So just in my final words, I just want to say that it is obviously eminently 
possible to deliver on this objective. We need loss and damage clearly at the top of the agenda at COP26 and as a standing item moving forward. We need to see the opera operationalization of this Santiago network for loss and damage, including delivering resources needed to provide technical assistance. And thirdly, absolutely essential that we see this new and additional finance. There are many places we could find that money. As Salim will said, when it's the US or Germany and, and their citizens, then the money is, is found. Well, we need to find the money right now, whether that is from a fossil fuel uh, industry by, for example, absolutely cancelling the grotesque subsidies that still prop up the fossil fuel industry, or we could find the finances from a financial transaction tax, or from an air passenger levy, or from a climate damages tax, or from the issuance of special drawing rights. There is no shortage of possibilities. What we need is the will to actually start doing it. We urgently need an international solidarity facility to channel new funding to vulnerable countries to address loss and damage. And we also urgently need to cancel their debt to free up the resources to build resilience to the impacts of the climate emergency and to address loss and damage. The UK presidency could take a first small step towards this by listening to the calls for a specific loss and damage champion who could take forward this critical issue and make sure that it doesn't get buried in the rest of the agenda. So with fewer than six weeks left until COP26, time is running out. And as president, the UK has a real responsibility to build a consensus around the issue of finance. On that note, it is crucial that we see rich countries put aside their concerns about liability and compensation and come from a place of solidarity. Solidarity with those at the front line of the climate crisis whose lives and livelihoods are at stake. With the latest IPCC report spelling a code red for humanity in the words of the UN General Secretary, it is clear that loss and damage can no longer be ignored and must be at the heart of the Glasgow negotiations. Thank you so much, Caroline, for such eloquent words. It is fantastic that you are in the House of Commons, that you are an MP, you're able to express so, so articulately um, these concerns. Um, and, um, and absolutely, thank you as well for name checking the financial transaction tax and the climate damages tax, something that, as you know, uh, our organisations have been pressing uh, for a long time. And indeed, the International Solidarity Facility or Fund for Loss and Damage is really at the heart of the, the ask going forward. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that maybe in my closing words, but um, just want to say I may have quoted uh, Boris Johnson, but I was using the language that he's captured, but he's not, he's, he's, he's talking the talk, but he's not walking the walk. That was the point I was trying to, to make there. Um, okay, so I will then um, pass on. So Jeff had fallen off the call, he's back with us now. So I'm just going to uh, introduce you again, Jeff, um, from the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, uh, co-founder of the Youth Climate Strike Movement in the Philippines, and joining us to share his personal experience uh, of loss and damage in the Philippines. Over to you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, David, for that. Um, again, uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jefferson, and like Vanessa, I'm a climate activist from the Philippines. We already talked about why youth are striking, the science behind of climate justice and climate crisis, and why we need to prioritize funding for loss and damage. I think we need to hear the effects of loss and damage who experienced it at first hand like me. 11 years ago, I survived the super typhoon Ondoy or typhoon Ketsana when I was 11 years old. And ever since then, after I survived the typhoon, I have spent my, my entire youth related to environment and youth empowerment. But in 2013, another disaster came to us and it was considered the strongest typhoon recorded in human history, the Typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda that struck our country last November 8, 2013, that almost killed 7,000 people. And while we are suffering from the global pandemic, eight typhoons have ravaged our country in less than two months last year that uh, damaged our islands and considered the deadliest, those typhoons considered deadliest typhoons to hit the Philippines while we are suffering from the pandemic. 
that affects a lot of Filipinos and wipe out 10 billion pesos from the agricultural sector. And while we are suffering from the global pandemic up until this um, time, Filipino communities and countries in the global south are, are bearing the effects of impacts of the climate crisis. This is not another story of resilience, but another reason to demand accountability, especially to the mar major carbon contributors. This is what the climate crisis looks like, and it will continue to get worse if we don't act now. Today, we talk about the most basic form of security, the need for our people to feel secure when they sleep at night, to feel safe when they go to work, or even in just simply living their lives amidst threats of disasters brought by climate change. Such security emanates from having confidence and trust in our governments and its systems that when the next typhoon strikes, we will be better prepared to meet the challenges head on. There will be always typhoons or natural disasters strengthened by the climate crisis, probably far worse than we have experienced thus far. And our people should feel confident that even in worst of situations, they would have a fair chance of returning safely to their homes and they will not fear their lives. They also need to feel secure that their loved ones will be safe in their homes, notwithstanding the rains. And if there's some, and if there should be flooding, the government, our leaders, the global leaders should prepare to rescue us and offer decent temporary shelter worthy of human dignity. Right now, the unprecedented scale of destruction inflicted on communities opened the eyes of the world to the true extent of climate change impacts. A preview of what future humankind faces without drastic actions taken. But do our leaders taking action? I don't think so. This is why we strike. The Philippines still feels the impacts of catastrophic events the, our rehabilitation efforts or process in some of the hard hit areas has yet to be finished, furthering the plight of our communities. Debates continue among government officials and non-government stakeholders to adequately address potential disasters of similar intensity, especially with the climate crisis threat. And I would say that this is same with the countries from the global, global south. Our house is on, is on fire, but it's not our fault. And we don't contribute as much as Global North has done, but we must sound the alarm. As part of the youth sector, we will inherit the earth and we will not accept a dead planet. This is why we ask for climate justice. We ask to prioritize funding for loss and damage and why we are here. The moral and legal responsibility of the North to act based on the fair shares cannot be papered over the climate agreements and beyond Paris Agreement nor COP26. I am watching. The Global South is watching. The world is watching. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Jeff. And it's so important to, to hear your personal testimony. It brings us home to, brings home that this is, you know, not just now, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been happening for many, many years, especially uh, tragically in, in the Philippines. Uh, certainly, when I was learning about this, it was really reading about uh, Super Typhoon Yolanda that, uh, that, that, that made me understand how real um, the loss and damage uh, phenomena is. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your wonderful contributions. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to move over to now the, the questions that are being fed to me from this chat. Um, and the first one is for Vanessa, it's from Irfan Ula. How do you see the youth role, especially the uh, Global South role, to amplify the voices on loss and damage in COP26? Yeah, thank you so much. I think our role here is to talk about it and create as much awareness as possible. We may not be in the you know offices or positions that uh, decide on what policies or what finance, but we can demand for it uh, through our voices. We can demand for it through our platforms, using our platforms. 
and uh, you can start by sharing uh, the film that you know the the loss and damage film that you have all watched. I think that is a first step to you know to doing something uh, to demand for you know climate justice. You know to talk about loss and damage as a a great climate justice issue that very few people are talking about or even know about. So use your platforms and. If you're able to mobilize and organize our protests, you can also do that. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. I've got a question here for Haji from Nusrat Chowdhury. In the developing countries, the non-economic losses may well be more significant than the economic losses. What can be proposed to assess non-economic losses? Thank you, Nushrat. No, this is a very important question. Uh, so far, whenever we talk about loss and damage, we only talk about the economic impacts. Uh, Vanessa and Caroline both alluded to how we need to also understand the losses that communities are facing, such as loss of culture, loss of language, loss of territory. And many of these are irreversible loss and damages and loss of biodiversity. You know, communities depend on those ecosystems that we are losing every day. Now, but this is such a moral issue. And on one hand, we cannot put a price tag on these non-economic losses. And no, no amount of money can help recover such a loss uh, and damage. So leaders need to first look at it as such a big moral issue that how our years and decades of inaction is causing irreversible loss and damage. And if we close our eyes and imagine what will what will we feel uh, if we lose our homes and territories forever? We can't even go back to our burial sites and our religious sites. So it is it is a, an important moral issue, but somehow our leaders have not internalized it. So it is extremely important to put a spotlight on this non-economic aspects of loss and damage. Um, as I said earlier, we cannot put a price tag, but we need to highlight these. But at the same time, it points to the urgency of action now so that we can minimize that. But there are cases where money is going to be required to recover, you know, like the example of oil spill, when you have to revive ecosystems, when you have to provide psychosocial support to communities, which is, you know, uh, you're taking care of your mental health, it requires money. So first, really internalizing how important this issue is and how urgently we need to act. And then doing solidarity and being far more empathetic and, and sensitive in our response. You know, we also talk about people getting displaced. We know millions are getting displaced now, but we have not created a system to help them. So we need to look at the entire spectrum of loss and damages, both economic and non-economic, and then create systems, both economic measures, as well as many non-economic measures to deal with uh, such losses. All right, thank you very much, Haji. This next question is for, for Caroline. Um, I can't see who it's from, but it's a very important question. What do you think is the best way to raise loss and damage with UK MPs in, in Parliament to move this forward? Thanks, um, David, and thank you for the, for the question. I mean, it's something that we've been trying to do with the climate change all party parliamentary group and Salim all very uh, kindly came and spoke at one of our meetings. I think there is still a lack of understanding of how it's different from uh, money for adaptation, for example. Um, so I think part of it's just simply awareness raising about what we're talking about. Um, and then secondly, I think it is the kind of moral arguments that Hajit was just speaking about as well. I mean, it is very odd, as I'm sure David will have found too, to have a prime minister right now as we do in the UK, you know, using this language in New York about, uh, about injustice essentially, about how the, the larger economies have basically trashed the, the futures for, for, for the smaller economies and, 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 the, and the global south, without actually really recognizing what the implications are of what he's saying. So I think we can use some of his language back against him to say, yes, too right. There is a historic uh, responsibility here for, for countries of the rich North, like the UK, especially the UK, given our historic responsibility. And, and what are you going to do about it? And I think it will be important. I think sometimes the loss and damage debate gets caught up as, as Salimul 
kind of hinted at with, with very precise concerns about the levels of compensation or the levels of liability going forward. And if you're not careful, you get caught up in some kind of legal arguments. And that's often a very convenient excuse for not going any further. And I think, uh, as he and others have said, if we start from a position of solidarity uh, rather than a kind of legal requirement and just say that it is just morally wrong that richer countries have become rich at the expense of poorer countries because we have been pumping this stuff into the atmosphere for decades, if not centuries. Um, and, and therefore we have a moral duty to do something about it. I think, I think that does get us some way and it certainly gets us further than I get, I think getting really kind of caught up with the, with the narrow legal arguments. Thank you very much for that, um, uh, Caroline. I, I'm going to note we're already in the last 10 minutes. I'm just gonna, um, so this is a question for Salim, sorry, I'm just finding it. Can a UN mandate for a special rapporteur on human rights and climate change help secure financial commitments from governments on loss and damage? Any thoughts on that, Salim? Sure, sure. so this uh, demand for a human rights rapporteur is something that the climate vulnerable countries have been demanding in the UN uh, uh, High Commission for Refugees and the Human Rights Council. Um, we hope hopeful that we will get enough support to uh, mandate it. Uh, the job of that human rights uh, commissioner or rapporteur will be to link the issue of climate change to human rights. And a loss and damage is very much, a, I don't even call it a climate justice issue. I call it a climate injustice issue. It is absolutely manifest injustice. You know, every religion teaches that the rich should not harm the poor. I mean, you don't even have to be told that. An atheist knows that. It doesn't need to have a religion to know that. And that we're doing it anyway. It is a morally wrong. So each and every one of us should challenge this injustice, which we can see, and say that's not right. Shouldn't happen. We should do something about it. And I would uh, hope that this would be one of the things coming out of this uh, uh, event and the, the video. We galvanize uh, society to accept that this is wrong and something should be done about it. And then in the international negotiation space, whether or not we can get some funding, I would say, yes, let us, you know, think of a solidarity fund. You know, what about, why don't we think of, you know, the school kids who go out on strike every Friday, they just contribute their lunch money on Friday. And we put that into a fund, a solidarity fund uh, from all over the world, including school kids in Bangladesh, putting the money in for the victims of the climate change. Can we think of setting up a fund, a global solidarity fund on uh, uh, loss and damage? I mean, in fact, I've uh, pitched this to the Scottish government because Scotland has its own aid, uh, which is separate from uh, the UK, and it's quite progressive. And I said, why don't you start a, a Scottish uh, a loss and damage fund and solicit contributions? If governments want to give their money, fine. If others want to put money in, let's kick it, let's kick start it and get it going. And let's all contribute to it. We shouldn't be sitting idle and, and demanding things. And then if they don't happen, we don't do anything. I think we can do a lot as well. Thank you very much for that, Salim. Um, I think it is very important to bed down the idea of a solidarity fund. There is obviously the question of scale uh, and responsibility and who uh, should really most be called upon uh, to contribute to that. But I think that's part of our wider uh, discussions as we, as we go forward. Um, I'd like just to give the panel um, uh, a minute to give final thoughts. I think, um, Salim, if it's all right, having just given those thoughts, I'm going to move on from you. Sure. No um, and I'll go to, I know that Hajit knows this is coming. So I'm going to go to Hajit first. So it gives the other three a chance to, to have, a, um, to gather some thoughts for a final minute. So Hajit, over to you for a minute's final uh, roundup thoughts. Well, I, I will underline things that have been said. Uh, it's very clear that thousands are, are losing their lives and millions are being uh, forced to flee their homes. And this is sheer injustice that we have seen uh, for years now. And decades of inaction has caused the climate crisis. And we cannot allow that injustice to continue. 
And this is also a golden opportunity uh, for the UK COP26 presidency to really deliver on what, what they have been now acknowledging that who has caused the crisis. And as you said, David, let's, let, we, they need to walk the talk and walk the walk by now setting up a fund at COP26, which should be operational by next year. Unless money reaches the pe people who are facing climate emergency, all these conferences and talks are not going to work. We need to now act and, and deliver something uh, than just claiming to be a leader uh, on climate change. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Jeff, do you want to come in with uh, final thoughts? All right, um, I think we have heard enough about this issue. I would just like to reiterate and um, let's focus on the note that while we are talking about this, um, we should also note that the youth should not be taken as um, just a display on this conversation. We need to be uh, uh, involved in the discussion. We, we don't need to be just like take it, taken as um, token or be tokenized in the conversation, but rather be part of the conversation because we're not just talking about um, the disasters that, that are happening in our own countries, but also we are talking about our future. It is our collective future, our future that we are talking about it, about here. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. And, and, and Vanessa, would you like to follow on from, from there, please? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. It was really great um, being on this panel. I think we should just really uh, continue with the conversation and with the demands. Let it not just end here with the panelists. It should continue with the panelists and also everyone who has been able to watch um, this panel discussion because we need leaders and governments to acknowledge that loss and damage is here with us now and to do everything they can to provide the fund for loss and damage. So let's all work together and work united. We'll be able to transform this world and make it a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to Caroline. Thank you. I, I guess I would just say that um, Jeff and, and, and Vanessa have, have very eloquently pointed out why this is an issue of intergenerational justice as well as climate justice and justice between North and South and so forth. And I think the, the voices of young people are going to be incredibly powerful going forward. I think COVID has shown us that the, the response to the, to the COVID pandemic, particularly in those richer countries that have been able to respond. If, if I look at the UK, I think what it has shown us is that when governments want to act, if they have the money, they can find it. You know, um, we've seen that overnight in the UK, the government absolutely wrote off the debt for the NHS, for example, and it found the money to house the homeless and it found money to keep people at home instead of exposing themselves to COVID. And although it's backtracked on quite a few of those since then, I think it just shows what is possible when a recognition of urgency is more widely shared. And I just think we need to absolutely keep the pressure on to say that the money can be found for this. The money is always there. And just to give a shout out again to one of the proposals that I think David has been working on with his organization, I think the idea of a climate damages tax is something that will get so much support because people know it's wrong that fossil fuel companies are making billions of pounds out of so much harm and damage and loss and death, frankly, that other, other people in other countries are suffering. So a climate damages tax is a proposal for charge for each tonne of coal or barrel of oil or cubic litre of, of gas, depending on how much CO2 is embedded in each of those, of those for different fossil fuels. So it will be done in a fair way, a scientific way, but way in which I think we could really get the public behind. That, that's brilliant. I couldn't have put that better myself, but then... <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> it was, it's your words I'm reading out. You have to... <laughs> uh, thank you so much for that. Well, we're, we're coming close to the end. I just want to round off by um, just um, thanking again um, Teo for his work on the direction of the film, um, to, to Mark Strong, 
Uh, to all our funders, especially Bread for the World and Heinrich Boll, um, and a big shout out to uh, our friends at Cannes International uh, for hosting this and giving us the logistical support. So thank you, Kat. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, um, Haji, for insisting on the rehearsal, which was really useful. Um, uh, and, and to my colleague, Charlotte, who's done an amazing amount to make sure this, this event could take place. Um, so um, a huge thank you for all of you uh, who have come to this event. Um, please do uh, push the film out far and wide. Uh, and lastly, of course, thank you to this wonderful panel, to Vanessa, to Salim, to Hajit, to Jeff, uh, and to Caroline. I would just want to close with a, a, a few personal words. Caroline's absolutely right that the money can be materialised. That COVID, if there's a lesson about COVID, that is surely it that um, all those things that we, would, we were told, no, you can't do that, we can't afford that, we can't get the money for that, that's not possible, changed virtually overnight. So it is a matter of political will. Um, and then when we look at, you know, have there been funds in the past that have been created to meet a need? Well, the funds for HIV, AIDS, TB and malaria is an absolutely clear example where it didn't exist, and then there was this major pandemic, and then this fund was created, it still is created, and it has multi, it has three year rounds of raising billions, and it works, and it meets needs. So we do have a clear example um, out there uh, that we can follow. Um, and it's uh, absolutely right to, uh, to take Boris's language, Boris Johnson's language, and turn it uh, uh, turn it against him or turn it to, to, to make him do uh, what uh, he needs to do. Uh, and uh, the, the worst problem is if he uses this language and he gets away with using this language and capturing this language, but not doing what is really behind what has to happen, which is to meet this injustice with the money that is required to pay for loss and damage. So uh, on that note, uh, I just ask you, please sign the petitions, uh, get involved, disseminate the film, and thank you everyone for being involved in this event on the first ever Loss and Damage Awareness Day. Thank you everyone. And with that, I will close proceedings. Thank well you. done, everybody. Great job. Cheers.